Now, look, uh, we've heard three, I think, incredible panels, but um, we face a reality where we're still losing uh, 10 million hectares of forest every year. What more can we do to halt deforestation and enable sustainable commodity production? And I, again, I, uh, super excited about this panel. So let's, um, let's rotate and thank again our wonderful panelists from up here. And, uh, and invite the final panel. And uh, I'll specifically invite Laura Vary, who's the Chief of Party of the Forest Data Partnership, which you've already heard about from Rebecca's presentation. And they're going to show the role of technology and innovation in tackling deforestation and, and trying to ensure sustainable commodity production. So please. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julian. This has really been a wonderful afternoon of fascinating presentations, and I'm really thrilled to be here today to talk to you all about them, about what we are doing on the sustainable commodity side. I have a great, we have a great set of panelists here today. Um, but I, I think from our perspective, what I really want us to come back to is this idea that data has always played a role in um, a vital role in sustainable management of forests and land. Advancements in technology that we've heard about already today and seen in the atrium this morning and the availability of new data sources offer unprecedented opportunities. We've heard so many examples, but I think we now are at a new precipice with the evolving regulatory landscape and we'll be hearing a lot about that in this panel and how that's bringing greater accountability to companies to disclose where their products originate from. There has never been more an urgent need to have reliable, accurate data so that all parties, and I mean everybody, can establish meaningful pl plans to monitor and demonstrate progress toward ending commodity-driven deforestation and forest degradation. So today, we are gonna be hearing from this wonderful suite of panelists from front of me, but we'll be starting with Rene Kolditz from the Joint Research Center. Um, to discuss this, his team's work from the, for the EU Observatory on Deforestation and Degradation. So, Rene, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's always challenging to be the last speaker on, of, a, of, of, of the keynote speaker of the last panel. Um, I will talk to you about the um, Observatory on Deforestation and Forest Degradation. I will begin with two slides which sort of lay out um, what the legal framework is and what the observatory is in the first place, and then I come to uh, the critical component in the context of um, as, a, as a support tool to implement the um, EU regulation on deforestation-free supply chains, EUDR. Um, so what you see on the slide here is the legal framework um, for, of the EU, how to tackle um, uh, forests and, in, and how the uh, observatory is connected to this. In 2019, um, there was the communication um, on um, stepping up EU action to protect and restore the world's forest. And so to say, as childs of, um, of this communication um, emerged on the one hand side, the regulation, and also in this communication, it was announced to launch a observatory. Um, and this is the observatory which went live in December last year. Um, this is a website and um, it has a couple of components I will show you in a minute. On the right hand side, you see more the domestic framework. Um, there was the forest strategy adopted in 2021. And in this forest strategy, which is very much domestic focused, um, it was announced to um, bring forward a legal framework for EU forest monitoring. So this is forest monitoring in the 27 EU member states. And in November last year, the commission adopted a proposal 
um, for a EU forest monitoring law, which is now in discussions with the co-legislators, so with Parliament and the Council. Um, you see the, the, with the wide arrows are the arrows which really indicate how the observatory is nested. Um, the domestic framework has a couple of linkages to the observatory. The regulation mentions as a support tool also the observatory, but it is not in the operational part of the legal framework. It is not an article, it's a recital. And this is very important to, to keep in mind. The observatory itself has three pillars. One is the monitoring. Um, and I will primarily, no, I will only speak about this um, first row, which is also a little bit highlighted, this global forest cover map. There are a couple more maps and monitoring tools made available via the observatory. The second column is a set of um, visualizations of product and trade flows, um, visualizations of data from FAO, Stud and UN Com Trade, which is also quite um, telling. Uh, what, what are the trade flows between the different countries? And the third one is a set of tools for forest monitoring. This is not brand new. This is a work on which the JSC, uh, the Joint Research Center, has worked for years. And this is made available here also via the observatory. And of course, this will always be expanded when new data sets and tools come online. Now, on the on this global forest cover map for the year 2020, and I deliberately call this version one because if you are in the mapping world, there will be updated versions of the same map. This is just natural because better um, re, uh, data will become available, new data will become available, and this will then be ingested in the process. And we will, for instance, by the end of this year, provide an updated version of this global forest cover map for the year 2020. So stay tuned, towards the end of the year will be an update. Um, this map is a globally consistent, harmonized representation of forest across the globe um, at 10 meters spatial resolution. And the patches we retain in the map have at least half a hectare of size. Um, this also matches a bit the understanding of what forest is um, in the context of a regulation. We did not process satellite data from scratch, but the map uses existing layers which indicate where forest could be or where forests will definitely not be. I can also tell here you straight away um, this, uh, how the map was constructed. We use Google Earth Engine because this is let's say the easiest tool um, to, to compile this uh, quite significant amount of data. And I'm also proud to announce today that today we published um, the technical report which lays out the input data sets, the methodology and the first preliminary assessment of the accuracy of this map. Um, and on my last slide, you will see the web link for this. The challenge in mapping forests is um, that trees are not necessarily forests and not every forest has trees. Agriculture trees do not belong to forests under the definition. And if there, if there was a harvest or a forest fire recently and you observe that plot of land, the satellite images, the forest land use remains, yet there are no trees. And this is really the challenge. And uh, in broad terms, uh, the methodology is quite simple. It has two broad steps. In the first step, we compile data principally of tree cover to estimate where forests could possibly exist. And in the second step, we begin to reduce um, this extent, which is the spatial extent, which maps potential forest areas and um, basically limit this to where we think forests and definitely exist. So forests cannot be where urban areas are, where water surfaces are, but we also begin to take out areas where we have, you have agriculture plantations. This has limitations. Um, here we see one of the input data sets um, to map this initial extent where forests could possibly exist. This is the world cover data set produced by the European Space Agency for the year 2020. What you see in green is tree cover, not forest. And all the other classes, or all the other colors, are the land cover classes. Now, um, this is an example which illustrates quite nicely the difference between what is tree 
cover in what is a forest, the island of Borneo. There are lots of trees, but on the right hand side, you see the snapshot um, in this, this pinkish tone. These are all palm plantations, so they don't belong to the definition of forest as set out by the FAO or as set out under the EUDR. Um, and on the very far right, you see the definition of what forest is or is not, um, because the agriculture areas have to be taken out. This is a representation of the final product um, of the map. The map is um, open and freely accessible to everybody. One can view it or download it or also access it on Google Earth Engine as an asset. Um, now I will zoom in on three cases which illustrate how the map, um, maps forest more or less correct. Um, I can tell you that the level of accuracy in the report is 76%. We estimate we will undertake a, a statistically robust accuracy assessment in the second quarter of this year. We have the indications also from our reviewers. We had a qualitative review of this map that the map accuracy is around 80%. Uh, this is a representation um, where the reviewers and also we think that the delineation of forest is quite correct. Um, so whenever you, there are denser forest stands with clear boundaries, the map distinguishes this relatively well. Um, so this is a satisfactory result. Now to come, we come to one of my favorites. Um, this is a area of dry forests in an open landscape. And in this, case the delineation is probably okay and here also our reviewers acknowledge that this is of course very challenging to map forest in such landscapes because there are only two cases it's binary it's a forest or it's a non-forest there are only two classes in the map there is not a little bit of forest foreseen here it has to be binary and to to delineate forest in such a landscape will result in different maps by every interpreter and probably differs even by day to day. Um, it is an extremely challenging sit situation and this is also where the map, um, the, the probability that the map is correct in such open landscapes, in ecotones and dry forests, in transitions between land uses, there yeah, it goes down. As a third example, um, this is an illustration of um, an aquaculture plantation. Here it's cacao, cocoa, it could also be coffee. This is also where we know we have mapping problems. There's a lot of forest mapped here, and I can tell you that on the right-hand side, with snapshot of the image, there would be hardly any forest as defined under the, uh, un under the definition of forest, because it's all aquaculture land use. Coffee or cocoa plantations are too challenging commodities where we know the map has deficiencies. Now, final slides, a little bit of the use of the map in the context of the EUDR. Um, there is this recital um, to where, where, where the um, observatory is announced um, as a support tool, not as a must. Um, there is no authoritative role of the, of the observatory or this map foreseen in the regulation. We see the main use of a map in the face of a risk assessment by the operator. Um, in particular, in situations when there are no other data available. Um, there could be situations also where the map could play a role in the validation process, in the verification process. This has to be decided by the competent authorities, but we would not recommend to use the map as such for verification purposes for two reasons. Number one, 80% accuracy is not enough to demonstrate compliance. And number two, 10 meter spatial resolution is also not enough. Much higher resolution data will probably be needed in order to demonstrate that their due diligence was not, in particular, was not correct. Um, but the map could be used in order to find places 
areas where to zoom in, where to buy high resolution data, and then to undertake compliance checks and uh, to identify zones which are critical, for instance. And in such cases, this map can be useful in order to identify those zones and then buy the data because the data cannot be bought probably across the board. Now, um, there is, the map is not mandatory to be used in the EUDR. In fact, if you read the regulation, you will not find the word map in the entire text. Yeah? What, the map, what the regulation says is that the operator has to provide the geolocation of the sourcing area. Um, you can use other information for the due diligence process. This could be geotagged photos, this could be also information which are uh, demonstrations that you are correct, there's no obligation to use a map. Um, the map is not exclusive, which means other maps are equally valid. If you have national data, if you have local data, I almost urge you to please make use of this. Because even if we can demonstrate that our map is accurate, 80% accurate at, at, uh, for the global scale, we cannot ensure this at the local scale. If you have a local map and this map is 80% accurate, it's 80% accurate for the geographic scope you map for the local or for the national data. And this is much better because we don't know if our map is maybe just 60% accurate in your specific area. There, there is still a role for the map of the JRC or other global products as well, because having two, three, four, five, six maps available for the due diligence process is certainly a strong indicator if the six in, uh, maps indicate that this is an area which was not forest in 2020, that is quite, uh, quite a telling story. Or if all maps indicate it was forest, that is also a quite uh, telling story um, rega regarding the, the deforestation. But other maps have definitely an equal status. And finally, it is not legally binding. It doesn't mean that if you have a polygon and that coincides with our map and being forest in our map, it is not per se a deforestation, nor vice versa. Yeah? No authoritative status of our map. It is a support tool among many other tools which are available. And with this, I come to a close. Um, these are the, the links. One, the first one goes to the observatory. The second one, I'm sorry that it's all alphanumeric, but this is how DOIs are generated. This is uh, the link to the report which just became available today. And at the bottom, you see the entry to the observatory. Maybe just one final word. You find various maps on the observatory. The map to be consulted or to be looked at if you want to, to use a map for, for implementing the EUDR would be the global forest cover map. Because I get this question about every second day. There are other maps available. They have a scientific status as well, but they are not, let's say, made in the context of the EUDR. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate your presentation and particularly how clearly you laid out all of the things this map can and cannot do. And congratulations on finishing up the methodology and having that all available for people to access. That's fantastic. Um, please, if you have questions for Renee, keep them. Uh, and we will hopefully get to them by the end of the session today. But now I want to move on to the panel. Here we have some wonderful collections of both technical experts from technology companies as well as people implementing this policy and working towards getting this policy um, into, into action. So we will start with um, El Elka Sumnik Matai. Apologize if I mispronounce. Um, she is the director of the SAFE project from GIZ. And Elka, I think it would be great for us to understand a little bit what is this SAFE project and also how is it building on these innovations to facilitate access for smallholders to be compliant with the UDR. Great, thank you very much. And I'm, as everyone probably here, super happy to be here. And it's definitely been an inspiring day and I've learned a lot. And hopefully I can tell you a little bit more about, yeah, 
what we do at operational level to support the implementation of the EU deforestation regulation, of which we've heard a lot since uh, uh, early this morning, also with the demonstrations. So, um, yeah, since we've heard a lot about the EUDR, I'm very happy to talk about SAFE because it's one of the implementation mechanisms, the projects uh, co-funded by the German Economic Ministry for Development Cooperation and the EU Commission to support especially smallholder farmers um, within this context of the new uh, EU regulation. And this is something we heard about this earlier in a previous panel as well, that this is really something we need to focus on and it's at the heart of this project. And now you might be asking what SAFE stands for. So it's the Sustainable Agriculture for Forest Ecosystems Project. And uh, it's one of the flagships uh, under the new Team Europe initiative on deforestation free value chains. And I'll mention something on the new TEI uh, in just a bit. So SAFE is currently being implemented in six countries, Brazil, Ecuador, Indonesia, Zambia, and we've just started implementation and setting up the projects in Vietnam and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And since today is a day of exciting news, we also foresee further funding from other EU member states in the context of the EU, um, of the Team Europe initiative, which will enable us to also uh, support more countries and more smallholders in this transition. Um, we work on several levels in the SAFE project. So we work on enhancing technical knowledge. We work a lot on capacity development measures, expanding traceability systems, which I think is something, a, a common thread here today. Um, but as I mentioned, a real focus is on what does this all mean for smallholders and what, how can we ensure that they don't fall out of the EUDR relevant um, value chains. So some examples that I want to present here today are uh, two national ones and then one, one more at global level. So specifically in Indonesia, we will start work very soon on working with an NGO on independent uh, palm oil smallholders plot level mapping. So here, the innovation is also combining satellite, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles and participatory approaches. And we hope that if this works out well, uh, it'll be a lot more time efficient uh, on including smallholders compared to the current or standard method of measuring uh, plots with GPS devices. Uh, in Brazil, uh, in a different example, uh, and this is quite exciting since this involves a lot of different stakeholders, we are working to develop a proposal for a common framework for the cattle sector on traceability. And um, here we're working very strongly with public and private sector initiatives, um, and we hope that it will strengthen inclusive and holistic approach to traceability in the cattle sector in Brazil. On the one hand, to create transparency on socio-environmental compliance, and of course, I think the theme here today is preventing deforestation um, along the supply chain. And uh, additionally, in the SAFE project, besides working in these six countries, something which I think makes SAFE very special is that we really work on scaling solutions and fostering knowledge exchange. For this, we set up regional dialogues uh, in Latin America and Southeast Asia and hope to set them up soon uh, in Eastern or Central Africa, especially on coffee, since you might um, have seen that the demands are growing there. And um, we're also working uh, a lot on global level activities related to open accessible data infrastructure, storage of geolocation data, traceability, forest monitoring, green financing, which I think was very relevant in the first panel here. Uh, and we are focusing a lot also um, with some partners here, going to work a lot on gender equity and inclusion um, within this context of the UDR. And uh, something which is also a, th a bit of a thread here today is the work with the Forest Data Partnership. We're also very excited that since the beginning of this year, we have a brand new collaboration with FDAP and joining forces with the Diaska Initiative of the GIZ, the World Resources Institute, Linux Foundation's Axtec Project, uh, and in very close collaboration with FAO to work on digital public infrastructure. And the aim here really is to enable compliance uh, with the EUDR, specifically for smallholder farm organizations. So what this means specifically is that we want to work on traceability through the development and deployment of open source building blocks, such as geolocation standards, protocols, models of software um, solutions that together form a public infrastructure. And the idea is really that this works for everyone because we see this as the EUDR actually is a very positive push uh, in, to, to allow for this. 
And last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, the Team Europe initiative, which is actually also very exciting, uh, will provide information and outreach to partner countries through a so-called hub. Um, it really is aimed at uh, more coordinated support and outreach by EU member states, um, different events, knowledge sharing, scaling. So the hub will also, all these ideas and solutions and innovations presented here today, the idea is that the hub can really provide this platform and reach more people um, to scale solutions for the EUDR. And if you want to know more, I'll be around afterwards. So feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elka, and we, <laughs> we couldn't be more thrilled about our collaboration with you. Um, I just want to make, bring online Rosalind, if we can bring her up on screen. Hopefully, she's there. There, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Rosalind. We, um, I will reintroduce you, even though she was a member of our previous panel, our first panel of the day, but the, Rosalind Ajay will join us from the Ghana Forestry Commission. And thank you so much for staying online with us all day today. Um, our question for you is, what is the role of a government institution like the Ghana Forestry Commission in providing enabling conditions for such a regulation to be implemented efficiently? We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, it's really good to see you online. And um, once again, apologies, I couldn't join, but I'm very happy to thank you to Julian and the team that I'm able to join virtually. And I've really enjoyed all the panels. Um, this might be the longest I've sat online um, to listen to these uh, conversations, but they have been very good, so I just couldn't move. Um, so this is yet another important conversation. Um, I'm sure in the first panel, we started getting some snippets of it. And um, Renee's presentation was brilliant. He touched on a number of things that I have in mind. And um, thank you so much, Rene, for bringing out all those different details. So for a government institution like the Forestry Commission, in the conversations that we are having in Ghana, we believe that an institution like the Commission One can be in charge of um, data generation, data management, data update administration, and then also um, classification uh, because the landscapes that we are talking about in Ghana's context, the Forestry Commission manages all the forest and wildlife resources. Now, even though we don't own the land, we manage what exists on the land and also what is beneath, like the minerals. That's not for the commission, but another government agency. That's because a government entity such as us then can be a data repository um, to help coordinate the need needed. And one in such an instance will be the mapping data that's needed. And um, Renee spoke about the fact that you don't necessarily need a map. Um, it's about the geolocations. But the question is, if you don't have um, a very good map, you could just be picking different geolocations. So um, what is the proof that that geolocation is um, a forest area or shouldn't um, have had a farm? or is not an illegally farmed area. So it is very important that we have such a map, particularly for the EUDR um, and the cutoff date that it has, that we have a map that clearly indicates what was existing in our farmlands at that time and what the government had already accepted as um, farms that are recognized and also can be um, also recognized in terms of the commodity production um, under the EUDR. Again, it's also important that government is able to do this to avoid data fragmentation, because what we've realized is that lots of the industry players are trying to develop their own maps. Um, there is no proper system in place for verification. Um, there's no proper system in place for how that data is produced. And so different in the, um, private sector entities would end up um, outsourcing um, different consultants to say, develop a map for me. But then again, it's the same landscape. Most of our private sector actors are working with the same smallholder farmers. The land hasn't changed. So what is the value in having such fragmented data that is um, being housed by different private sector parties? And it's also really different because they might be using different methodologies. Again, institutions such as the government of Ghana, um, represented in this case by the Forestry Commission, having been in existence for such a long time, would understand the landscape dynamics better. Um, 
Rene spoke about what a 10 um, by 10 meter resolution will give you. Um, what a 30 by 30 meter resolution will give you. Definitely we will need high res data um, in such instances. And not every company might be using the same type of data and even the methodologies that are being deployed. So government being in charge of that data production, generation, and management, administration, of course, with the necessary protocols and controls will be very useful to harmonize the information and also synchronize, um, particularly for the purposes of the smallholders um, or, or the commodity producers who are in the landscape. Another thing that government can do, and this is directly linked to the pro production of um, data, either through maps and others, is to get into land use planning. And this is very sensitive for Ghana. And Renee touched on um, a number of things. For example, trees do not necessarily mean forests. Now, if we don't have a very good land use map, we are going to get into a space where conversion of even old growth farms. In Ghana, we have cocoa farms that are very old. Now they look like secondary forests. Any satellite imagery now or about three years ago will capture them as secondary forest. Now, if tomorrow there is any government intervention that comes in to support farmers to go back into their old farms, um, any remote sensing imagery will capture it again, uh, probably as deforestation or forest degradation, but these have already been, they were farms. They have just been left unattended and they become secondary forest. But if we don't have a land use plan in place, that does land use zoning, it is going to be very difficult to determine what is what because we need documentation in such instances. So it's also one thing that a government entity like Forestry Commission or the government in total can come together, mobilize all the necessary players to develop a land use plan because obviously land use planning will not just be at the behest of one entity. We would need different stakeholders, but there should be a convening point. And that's something that we can do as the Forestry Commission. The other aspect is also about law enforcement because as much as possible, even though we have these cutoff dates, there should also be a systematic plan in place to prevent further encroachment. We shouldn't allow the encroachment to happen. And then we say that these are illegal farms. And so we are not going to purchase the commodity from there. There should be the law enforcement using both soft and, um, and for want of a better word, hard approaches, which could mean practical policing. Um, some soft approaches could mean working with um, community members, um, having some volunteer groups within communities who help with law enforcement. Another thing is also um, government being able to provide other alternative sources of livelihood. It's very important. And this might not necessarily be from the government's own funds. Um, for a country like Ghana that is currently seeking support from the IMF, um, we might not necessarily have the funds now to do that. But we can leverage on government's capacity within different circles to bring in some other sources of revenue or some other sources of capital or investment or financing to ginger up the system. Because um, issues of encroachment to a very large extent are based on livelihoods. I have said on different platforms that um, undertaking deforestation really at the local level or by a smallholder farmer, even if it should happen, might not be, it's not a hobby. It will be because there has there has to be a livelihood. Someone must wake up tomorrow morning assured of what they are going to feed on together with their families. So this is where government can also play a unique role. And in Ghana, we have been doing this, for example, through our Red Plus programs, using that to bring in other um, alternative livelihood programs that complement what farmers are already doing um, within their cocoa landscapes. And they might not necessarily need new land to implement some of these programs. Um, some are doing um, apiculture, some are doing aquaculture, some are doing vegetable farming, and they are able to integrate this so well within their already existing farmlands. So this is what government can also do to um, stimulate other sources of revenue and diversify the income sources for farmers. Again, I believe that um, government can also um, use their political power um, and it's linked to the point that I just made to understand how landscapes are changing and how to also engage. For example, the EUGR coming on board, what can we specifically do in having a conversation on the unique transition plan? Because every country is different. Um, Rene mentioned um, having that map does not necessarily mean it will speak to the landscape dynamics of Ghana. 
And so we might need to develop different levels of data. Um, we might need to get into different protocols that will nuance our unique case. And that high level political um, um, space is very good for a government like Ghana to say, let's, let me engage with my counterparts. Let me let them know what the unique case of Ghana is and how we can together provide the resources um, to support Ghana and its stakeholders, and also importantly, the industry um, to continue thriving and to continue um, contributing to the economic development of the country. So these are a number of the things that we are uniquely positioned to be able to do. We have been doing some um, largely to a very large extent, and um, we believe that there's, if there is that opportunity to do more, we should be able to capitalize on that to help with um, the deployment of any such regulation, because ultimately the goal of a government like Ghana, which has an NDC, is not to further continue deforesting. It is to end deforestation and to reverse it, but without the necessary um, tooling, that will not be possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalind, for joining us. And I really appreciate your, your reflections there, particularly on the lessons learned and how you can apply what you've already been doing on Red Plus to this particular context of supporting smallholders um, for EUDR. So thank you so much for that. Um, now I will turn to Michaela Foster from the European Forestry Institute and really think about how does the European Forestry Institute see this diversity of different technical solutions when it comes to implementing the UDR for sustainable supply chain management. So yeah. over to you, Miguel. Thanks, Laura. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today on International Day of Forest. So at EFI, through our programs, which will also include the upcoming technical facility on deforestation-free value chains, which will be part of the Team Europe initiative that Elka mentioned earlier, we work with a number of different partner countries across different commodities, um, providing technical support, piloting different approaches, and, and facilitating partnerships to try to combat deforestation and support sustainable supply chains. In our work in different contexts, we see a, a multitude of different tools and data sets that can support monitoring and enhancing supply chains. Um, but we also notice several challenges that actually make it very difficult to, to harness the power of many of these innovations. One being that the data landscape is incredibly complex and it can be a struggle at times to make sense of all of, all of the different things that are now available, what the limitations are in using different data sets for different needs, um, identifying what's still needed and then integrating different data sets, whether that's forest cover and loss data with commodity uh, information, as well as integrating global, national, and, and field data. As Rosalind mentioned, fragmentation and, and duplication of efforts is, is another huge challenge. And so while a lot of these technical advances really hold a, quite a lot of promise, there is a need for coordinated steering and, and harmonization of efforts to, to more effectively and efficiently actually harness and leverage the, these tools. And I think this is even more important now as new needs are emerging with the EU deforestation regulation that will require innovative solutions to, to ensure compliance. In our work at EFI, we see producer countries taking the lead to bring stakeholders together to build common understandings in supply chains and also in developing solutions that could, for instance, be used to, to support uh, due diligence efforts, but also to that can be more broadly used to, to tackle sustainability challenges uh, like deforestation. Um, an example of this um, in and our support has been working with the government of Ivory Coast in producing a 2020 land cover map. EFI supported this work along with the JRC who provided the external validation of this map, which has an overall accuracy of 91%. This map is or will be publicly available and is intended to be used as a key source of reference information for due diligence purposes um, to meet zero deforestation standards like what's under the EUDR, but also with the African Regional Standard on Sustainable Cocoa, as well as meeting um, other needs and, and other national purposes. 
The methodology was produced um, in a transparent way. It's aligned with international standards. It was also made in a participatory way with the um, Geospatial Institute responsible for producing the map, also uh, receiving input from the Coffee and Cocoa Council, as well as the Ministry of Water and Forest. And then after this map is launched next week, um, there, the Ivorian government will also have a, uh, is also planning a process to collect feedback from users of the map to improve specific classes. And I think here we can imagine a role, for instance, for the private sector who through, you know, supply management and sustainability programs have a lot of valuable data, high resolution images, uh, ground truth data that could, that could feed into this process and help to improve some of those classes. So I think this is a tremendous effort by the Ivorian government that should definitely be commended. But I also want to, to highlight um, not just the data aspect of it, but also some sort of process and design aspects of this project that are really working to facilitate partnerships for sustainability. One is that by making this data available to everyone, it serves as a basis for alignment among actors about key reference data, methodologies, and about what constitutes sort of robust and credible evidence for supply chain monitoring. On top, this type of open and transparent process helps to build trust among different actors, which I think opens the door for discussions on more sensitive topics like privacy and data ownership, uh, concerns about commercial sensitivities and costs, which are, are elements that often block data sharing. Um, and then as a, as a final point, um, by making this data readily accessible and promoting open dialogue, um, which is something that we sh can always remember that needs to be sort of actively supported and facilitated, it paves the way for continued investment in bringing stakeholders together to whether that's government private sector technical actors or other actors but bringing them together to continue to improve data quality data usability and and overall in in working together effectively and in, in, and in collaborating to to meet our broader and bigger goal of achieving deforestation free and sustainable supply chains Thank you so much. And I really appreciated what you said about building trust and how important that is for all of these aspects about data. Um, now I'm going to switch over to Michaela Weiss from WRI. And you know, Michaela, given your experience at Global Forest Watch, especially given that it's now celebrated its, its decade of being around, how do you see the role of geospatial data in this landscape and particularly open data? Great, thanks so much, Laura. Um, as Laura said, we did just celebrate our 10th anniversary of Global Forest Watch. Uh, and as has been explained in some of the previous panels, you know, we're starting to be at a point where we can actually track the impact that this kind of monitoring has had. Uh, Jessica talked about the um, randomized control trial we did with indigenous communities in Peru, but we're also seeing that kind of impact and collecting stories from around the world and many different types of use cases as well. I really see the niche of Global Forest Watch as looking at global and open data and making that more accessible. And I think all three elements of that can be important also for the EUDR in that kind of a context. Uh, the open part of that data, as others have already mentioned, you know, we're facing a, a sense of fragmentation in the data space and having everybody have access to the same information, whether that's private companies, uh, the regulators themselves or civil society can give us all a common ground to stand upon. The global information, of course, there are always pros and cons about using global data, but I do see a role for global data in providing consistency across geographies and ensuring that no locations have a gap in information. And finally, on the accessibility, as others have said earlier today, if nobody is using this information, then it's not going to have the type of impact that we want. Of course, open and global data is not an end-all be-all, and we definitely don't think that any one tool or one data set is going to solve the problem. But we do think that a combination of data sets can provide a benchmark, so a kind of base of information from which we can go deeper as needed. 
And I should also note that Global Forest Watch is a data agnostic tool. So we are not providing just one data set or, or promoting any single data set, but looking for the best available global data that we can serve out. So we have some data sets that we've created in house relevant to this conversation is a 2020 natural forest map that we developed together with the science based targets network. But we're also looking to incorporate the JRC's 2020 data uh, now that the documentation has been published. For private sector and EUDR in particular, we work most through the Global Forest Watch Pro tool. That is a tool that we developed specifically to meet the needs of companies, uh, having a secure login with two factor authentication, allowing companies to update thousands or even hundreds of thousands of polygons of their sourcing areas, and not necessarily looking through a map, but having more of a, a dashboard view of this kind of data. And we're increasingly seeing the need for access via APIs as well. And so that's something that we are working to actively develop. And as I mentioned, a really critical part of this is that these companies and GFW Pro is using the same data that is part of the entire Global Forest Watch system. And so all actors have the same kind of access to this information and are working from that same baseline. One additional point I want to make that hasn't come up too much yet in this panel is on near real time information as well. I think there's a lot of focus, understandably, on creating these 2020 base maps that we can look at in the context of this regulation. But I really see near real time alerts as a particularly actionable piece of information that companies, civil society, uh, the, the regulators, uh, competent authorities themselves can also be using to look at change over time. Uh, in a more actionable way. Jessica spoke a bit on the last panel about some of these data sets, but through Global Forest Watch over the past decade, we have been commissioning a number of these different deforestation alert products and have now begun integrating them into a single integrated deforestation alerts layer with the knowledge that most of our users don't actually care which satellite is detecting the change. They just wanna know where it is as quickly and as accurately as possible. And we've seen a lot of results uh, of this alert information. Jessica shared an example from indigenous community, but in the private sector as well, uh, there's a lot of interest in this kind of information. We had one example of a financial institution in Paraguay uh, that was using the deforestation and fire alerts through Global Forest Watch Pro. They found a fire happening in one of the farms that they financed uh, and they made a call to the farmer and, and, and basically let them know that there was a fire. And later on, the farmer actually came back and thanked them for that notification because they were able to find out about that even quicker than they would have otherwise and put it out and actually save some of the productivity of their land. And so having these tools, not only that tell us what happened in the past, uh, but also what is happening right now is a really important way that we can manage uh, our forests. So I'll, I'll keep to that in the interest of time. Uh, but just want to reiterate that open and global data is, is by no means a perfect tool, by no means the only tool, but we do think it is one of the tools in the toolbox for this work. And we're excited to continue providing access to this kind of innovative data that others on the panel are creating through Global Forest Watch. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michaela. Appreciate that very much. Um, moving on, we are coming up on our time. so. I appreciate everyone's interventions, and I, I now will pass it over to Nicholas Clinton, from a developer relations engineer from Google Earth Engine. So, Nick, what are some of the technical solutions that you are developing at um, at Google, and the different approaches that we can innovate together to make sense of this complex commodity data landscape? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Uh, it's just Nick. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, I was going to talk a little bit about the what we're calling the community model. And the idea of the community model is that we can do more together in collaboration than we can in competition. And the model that I'm using for this is what I call the data potluck. So for those of you who don't know, a potluck is a party. And uh, the idea is that everybody brings a dish to share at the party and then together you have this wonderful feast. And so that's what we wanna do with these community models. You can come with your training data and we'll make one model. You can come with your maps or your models and we can harmonize them. Um, the idea of that is that uh, it's inclusive. We're not throwing away any information. We're not throwing away any training data. We can pool them and combine them and 
uh, uh, make one model that uh, uh, works for everyone, or we can put that uh, model into an ensemble of models, and there are data-driven methods to harmonize those ensembles. So uh, it, specifically, uh, when you have an ensemble like this, some models might perform better in some place, and other models might perform better in other places. And uh, if you have a third data set, a data set not used to train any of the individual models in the ensemble, then you can learn where each model is most effective on the landscape or geographically. So that's the idea here. Uh, our first model uh, was for oil palm. We uh, showed that a little bit outside in the atrium. Uh, I think we're going to have another demo after, after these talks. Um, but we hope to, to do uh, roughly the same thing for uh, the other UDR commodities as well. Uh, the inputs to the model are right now public data, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Slope, but uh, we can swap those out, for example, uh, using uh, geo-foundation models or geo-embeddings, if you will. The outputs are not a mask. They're probabilities. And uh, we hope to keep it that way and, and to use those uh, probabilities to uh, inform a, a due diligence process, but uh, uh, also retain uncertainty in the output. So um, that's the idea of, of the community model is that uh, you get out a, a probability, not necessarily a mask. So we're not saying it's definitely palm here and it's definitely not palm there. Uh, we're providing a, a you know an estimate of how much we we think it is palm. Um, why does this matter to Google? Uh, first of all, uh, as part of Earth Engine, we're constantly trying to improve Earth Engine, and one of the big features of Earth Engine is the data catalog. So it's not just a data catalog; it's compute co-located with the data catalog, as Rebecca Rebecca talked about earlier, uh, and it's an API on top of that. So if you want to use that API, for example, to get into compliance with EUDR, we want to have the data layers already present in Earth Engine that are just going to make your life easier. Of course, you can download those and uh, put them in, in other products and um, uh, other softwares if, if you prefer, but uh, they're definitely there and they're convenient in Earth Engine. And um, uh, so, so that's uh, one of the reasons that we want to do this. The other thing that I want to note is that um, it's supposed to be an iterative process. So Renee mentioned that earlier. This is V1, and uh, you know, ho hopefully we're going to have uh, many more versions, and each one will improve over time with contributions of more data from the community. So we need specific tooling around the outputs in order to do that. Um, that might be something like ground, uh, which was talked about earlier today, where um, uh, a specific users, for example, smallholders on the landscape can contribute information about whether the model is right or wrong in their area of interest. Those folks know their areas better than anybody else in the world, better than anybody who's looking at high-resolution imagery uh, uh, from, you know, from space or, or airborne imagery. So uh, we're, we're really hoping to rely not only on uh, contributors of data uh, from the ground, but also uh, companies and, and private sector entities that are um, trying to use these products to be in compliance. If you find that the, that the layer is uh, not effective in your area of interest, please do contribute some data. We'll retrain the model or, or do some more training of the model, regenerate the outputs, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, make it available through Earth Engine. So the idea is that these layers will continually uh, be improving over time uh, by making them easily available, but also providing the tooling to, to get more data and uh, uh, to retrain the models. So uh, I think I'll, I'll end it there. That's our interest in, in building these community models and, and hosting them uh, in Google Earth Engine is, is to really make them accessible and useful, but also uh, provide a way for uh, to, to get more inputs from the community and build those back into the models and the maps so they are continually improving over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Really appreciate that contribution and explaining very clearly how we want to approach this community model building. Remy, we are really coming up on time, so you are going to close us out. Um, 
But this is Remy Denanuzio, who's a forestry officer here at FAO. And our question here for you is how can we develop innovative approaches for including smallholders into data collection efforts for UDR compliance? Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I think the reason for which we are close to time is that we have a fantastic panel. And I would, uh, I would just like to say how grateful I am that we managed to be all together on this, that we have such relevant institutions brought together to try to solve the issue. Um, so uh, what characteristics do we, would we need for the tools to be helping smallholders? I would focus on three. Um, the, the first one would be to be secure. Uh, I really also appreciated the previous panel. Uh, I think people really need to own their data and the way it's processed. Um, technology needs to be accessible. That was a very interesting question earlier. But data privacy is essential. Um, and we can't jeopardize people's safety by uh, releasing any um, personal info. Anonymity is key in those processes. And we need to make sure that this is at the core of the development of, uh, of solutions. The second aspect is that um, if we want smallholders to be able to uh, access those, those technology and use them, they need to have it at a really minimal cost. Uh, it needs to be freely accessible. Um, people won't have uh, the resources to pay for generating the geospatial data that needs to be generated to, in order to, to keep accessing uh, even standard markets. Um, Tanya was mentioning this in the previous panel that uh, these tools need to be made available to people. And uh, I would like also to keep in mind that the only way to make them available is through uh, open and free solutions, such as uh, what Global Forest Watch is doing, for instance. And this is, this is a place where I think we, we also converge. The last aspect I would uh, like to insist on is that those tools need to be simple. They need to be easy and light. They need to be um, uh, agile. They need to be uh, flexible and they need to be intuitive. Um, there's a lot of technology that needs to be done to do this. Actually, building simple and agile solutions is a complicated task. It requires a lot of resources, and I'm really, really glad that the collaboration between Google and FAO on building open forest ground has led to this. We, we have a really ex good example of this. Um, within the tools themselves, hidden behind simplicity, there's complex processes and treating data. Um, that has been made available and possible today thanks to the innovations we've seen over the past 10 years. Um, Google Earth Engine has been a major game changer in, in that horizon. Uh, René just mentioned that before. Um, there, was, there was no way to actually process and generate those kind of data sets without having the cloud computing um, 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 capabilities that are behind Earth Engine. And uh, the interesting thing is that this is now at hand. This is, this is available. This is, uh, this is a reality. And when we bring together those different data sets, uh, we are actually able to grasp the complexity of the story behind each polygon. Uh, what Rosalind was mentioning uh, is that the national data sets are key. The example of the Ivory Coast layer produced by Bennett with the support of EFI is also a really important um, aspect to all those. So I would just like to say um, those tools need to be uh, simple, secure, free. It requires partnership and alignment to produce that, uh, to be able to reach there. We have, uh, I'm really happy we're able today to launch those tools, uh, WISP, Open Forest Ground. We have really simple, intuitive, versatile solutions that are out there. And, uh, this is probably just the beginning of using those and grabbing feedback on them and seeing how they evolve. But I'm really excited to, to be on that path. And uh, yeah, I leave it there for the sake of time. Wow, you right on the nose, really, truly. Thank you guys so much. I really want to thank all of the panelists for joining us today. And I apologize for we are out of time for questions, but I believe that there will be some refreshments um, in the atrium where we can have some more of this discussion offline. Thank you to all who joined us online, especially Rosalind. Thank you for staying online all day. We really appreciate you. And um, back to you, Julian. Thank you. Yes, right. let's give them a big hand. Thank you. <laughs> wow, it's been four and a half hours together. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and thanks so much to Rosalind and, I, and I've seen a huge global audience and I've been final, we've been broadcasting live through through different media like Facebook and it, it's been 
I think our effort has been, uh, has been observed by many, and I hope my original objective to prove to you that foresters are in fact innovative, I, I think we've proved that fact, right? I think we've proved that fact. Across many dimensions, it's been, it's been really fascinating. So huge thanks to all the moderators, the, the keynote speakers, the panelists, the poor translators that put up with us speaking at a million miles an hour, and everybody online and in the room. I think let's all, let's all stay, let's all give ourselves a round of applause, stay safe, stay well, and uh, please, for those here, join us in the atrium. Don't, don't leave straight away. But yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Have, have a great day, stay safe, stay well. Bye.